So integrated design on the path to commercial building GME. Um, I really appreciate following Kathy. Um, I'll just start off um, with a little bit about me because my experience kind of parallels what this talk is trying to talk about. So um, it's my uh, I, I had a career that was doing other stuff and then switched to building science. I got a, a master's degree at UC Berkeley in building science and did research. Um, a lot of the stuff we've been talking about today. IAQ, energy, people, how it all comes together. Um, and then moved into design work. And I was a mechanical engineer for over 10 years, mechanical engineering, doing mechanical design, building energy analysis, and recently switched to policy. Um, and the question I'm asking for myself, and this talk is kind of trying to ask, is actually um, wrote down what you just said, Kathy, your favorite quote, um, Mark. The market is right now ahead of code. This is a new cycle. There's leaders in this room. Um, so the question that I'm going to get into in this talk and, and in sort of my personal career growth is how can leaders inform policy? How can we accelerate market adoption? How can we you know, basically close the feedback loop um, and, and bring everybody forward faster? Um, so the key concepts I want to try to hit on um, are that idea that advanced practice can inform policy. Um, I'm going to sort of focus in on achieving really deep energy efficiency requires a new way of thinking, more detailed analysis, and a big part of that is integrated design or the integrated design process. Um, and I can speak some of the person personal experience on that. Um, a couple highlights on that are, or, or just pieces of the integrated design process are doing life cycle cost analysis and doing cost op optimization. We're trying to find all the synergies that help you save money and achieve higher performance at the same time. Um, I should throw in that also um, better outcomes for people's health and wellness and, and comfort and productivity and all that. Um, there are significant challenges to taking these advanced ideas that we all take for granted and scaling that to a larger market. So the way I'm going to do that in this presentation is start with a few projects I, I worked on in my past job um, and then conclude with the results of a study we just did at CRC uh, for GGE on uh, looking at 29 advanced buildings in California. So slide three, um, Orinda City Hall. This is a highly integrated project in a fairly warm climate that the main overarching goal was to eliminate compressor cooling but maintain impeccable comfort and have a high performing building. Um, and so the design approach is mixed mode, there was natural ventilation when you could, there was night pre-cooling, but there was also an HVAC system. But the HVAC system was served by indirect direct evaporative cooling. And that was really by most people's calcs not possible. Um, so there were some things that, you know, all these different options and, and different systems coming together. To make it work for indirect direct evap cooling, the loads had to be reduced significantly. Well, that means you have to shade peak solar. So really aggressive shading. Um, you also have to address the plug, plug load issue and reduce what people are plugging in and using. Um, even with all that, during peak weather events, the comfort in the building was not going to stay within standard 55, which is the reference standard for comfort. Um, but if you start putting in ceiling fans that actually provide four degrees of sensible cooling, you can maintain comfort um, during peak weather events. And, um, and there's also, uh, you know, people are more comfortable when they have a lot of personal control. So putting in operable windows is sort of synergistic with personal control and comfort and also natural ventilation. So I'm just sort of illustrating that, that integrated design these things don't work unless they're all thought of together. And so we achieved this breakthrough, which is no compressors and really low energy use um, through that process. Next one, um, Chartwell School. This was an early project. You've probably heard, some of the, you know, those of you in the commercial space have heard about a lot. It's gotten a lot of press. Um, it was one of the, I think it was the first lead platinum school. Um, it had a zero net electricity goal, which at that time was very, very innovative. This is 10 or more years ago. Um, and it, it was also set out to achieve a really high performance learning environment in the school for students with learning challenges. Next slide. Um, the main point I want to make 
on this um, for sake of time is just the process, a, big, a piece of the process that's illustrated here, which is this energy simulation and life cycle cost analysis for a whole bunch of different energy efficiency options. A full analysis is done on what's the first cost, what's the maintenance cost, what's the energy savings. Let's rank all these. Let's, this one's presented in terms of um, life cycle cost through the 25 year study period. Um, and just, just a couple things to note. You know, we start off with a base case, and then that, the goal at the top there was electricity neutral, and we also looked at energy neutral. And there's a, that, that's an increased life cycle cost. Um, but that was before looking at efficiency. And efficiency is actually, this is a classic thing, isn't it? efficiency is more less uh, expensive than renewables. So at that point it was, maybe it, things are changing right now with the cost of PV. Um, and then we went to look at that envelope. You always should look at the envelope first, right? But in this project, with the larger commercial building, the envelope is actually not that significant. There's all these different envelope measures hardly made any difference one way or the other. And then we got into daylighting. Daylighting was huge. Um, it was cost effective. It lowered the, the total life cycle cost. Um, and the next ones, um, we're looking at ERV of energy recovery ventilation in classrooms and the multipurpose room. Separate analyses. The classrooms weren't cost effective, but the multipurpose room was. So this just keeps sort of going to the point where we go, okay, now we're going to add the, the um, PVs back in with the, the one that's. Um, circle there, 7B, was um, an electricity neutral building that's sort of the third uh, lowest life cycle cost, the way it's ranked there, because we've done efficiency first and then we've added the PVs in. Um, the point here is that this process of analysis is really useful to make sure you don't you, know, you can control costs and achieve these aggressive goals. The next one, um, slide six, Stanford Green Dorm. This was a feasibility study that unfortunately didn't get built. Um, the goals here, um, pardon the zero carbon <laughs> use of the word, um, is also supposed to be a closed water cycle. It was very, um, you know, the, all the goals that we've been talking about. So next slide, slide seven. Um, this is a similar uh, type of analysis. This chart just presented in a different way where all the different measures are along the bottom and the total life cycle um, cost and present value dollars is, is, is what's plotted there. And the point I want to make here is as you go across this, you start adding in um, from like, you know, column one to the next one, you start adding in efficiencies and it, there's a lot of cost effective efficiency you can add that lowers your life cycle cost. It's cost effective, has good payback, it's good, good for everyone saves you money, um, and that's a good thing. And then we start adding in maybe less cost-effective efficiency and start adding in renewables and, and also closed water cycle. These, the costs go up, you see as it's curving up here. And so the first point is cost-effective efficiency. The second point that was really impactful on this project is that if you follow that red line, you have a baseline building on the left, if you follow that red line across, you can achieve a much higher performance building, in this case a ZME building, for equal life cycle costs um, if you invest in efficiency and then add back in your renewables. Um, and that was something that convinced the Stanford trustees and funders saying, okay, we're not going to go for the lowest bargain basement building, we're going to go for a building that um, is really high performance um, and is you know, the life cycle cost is actually not that much higher or similar to a, a standard building. Um, slide eight. This is the study we did recently completed for PG&E. So this is um, a new thing at PRC. The idea here um, was, is to look at the current market of advanced commercial buildings in California and try to inform emerging technology research, um, codes and standards, so forth. Um, try to look to the market to push the market. Um, we looked at uh, I, all these buildings, we looked at all the strategies they're using, um, tried to identify barriers to implementation, what, what could be changed to uh, increase adoption. So all those measures are, are um, cataloged in the report. There'll be a, a full paper um, at the ACCC um, Summer Study, um, and there's a bunch of recommendations. 
so the on the right a little chart is just I just think I've said it already is just uh, you know, taking early adopters and quickly trying to rapidly get that into the code <laughs> and into standard practice. Next slide. Um, 29 buildings. We interviewed design teams. Um, we didn't measure energy in these. We didn't get energy data. Sorry, Kathy. Um, these buildings were generally education and office, generally smaller. Some of the early adopters are smaller, just like Kathy was saying. Um, generally new construction. Next slide, 10. So the big themes that we kind of uh, pulled out of the you know, high-level overview um, is that there's a big emphasis on passive and radiant systems. I'm just repeating what, what Kathy was saying also. Um, also daylighting. There was an emphasis by the interviewees on, on integrated design. Um, they were saying that you really have to do that to achieve the goal. Often it's sort of an owner-driven owner goal, and there was no way we could have kept it within the budget and lacked the whole team got together and found synergy. And that was the kind of quote we got. Um, it's the only way to be cost-effective is you have to do integrated design. Um, and then the last third part was controls, 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 controls. Um, and because it's more complex, and the controls are what, sort of where the rubber meets the road on energy performance. Um, and I actually put a quote in here, the controls are the nexus of energy performance, but I have to do a shout out to the CABA study that NDI, and I think Diane Edminster was working on, um, published, and that was something that came right out of the report. Controls are the nexus of energy performance. Mm -hmm. uh, slide? slide 10. Could you back up to slide 9, just for a moment? The, the, um, on the building types, we have four of them. There are other, do you, you know, do you remember what those four were? No. I can tell you then. So back to slide 10. Um, on the other side, a couple uh, recurring themes through all the actual case studies. Um, classic green building, load reduction is important. Um, the, a lot of the solutions that are being used are capacity constrained, like radiant cooling, for example, um, doesn't have the amount of capacity that a conventional HVAC system has. We have to reduce your load to, to do that. Um, and solar control and reduction of plug loads are, are the main strategies. And the second thing was a, a focus on occupant strength of solutions, you know, condition of person, not the building. And this was ceiling fans I gave you an example of. Um, it was sort of zonal conditioning, occupancy sensors, things like that. Slide 11. Uh, this is a, there's a lot of information here, so I'll just kind of gloss over it. Integrated design packages started to become a theme where there, were, there was a lot of variation in measures across all these buildings. Every building's unique, um, the creative solutions. But we started to see um, these three big things pop up, pop up more often. One of them is this passive and mixed mode building. It's partially air conditioned, partially, partially naturally ventilated. That was 18 buildings. And there were a few key themes and then some variations. I won't go into the details. Um, radiant cooling um, came up 11 times. And almost all the projects said that they're doing daylighting um, integrated with high performance controls, which is great to see because back with like the Cartwell project was actually early when daylighting technology was everyone said, well, it's not very reliable. So you know, 10 years ago, and now it's basically every building in this study um, is, is says daylighting makes, makes sense. Really? So these are all California buildings? All California. And did you parse these at all by climate zone, too, so that? You know, maybe three different kind of strategies. Was there a correlation to climate zone? It's a good question. In the integrated design packages, we didn't look at which climate zone they came from, but we know obviously because we have the raw. If you go back to slide nine, mm -hmm. we have the summary of all the climate zones. They yeah. span climate zones. Yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to look at those not only by climate zone but by building typology. And, yeah. Yeah. Some, you know, and there is some climate zone applicability for, for some of these, I mean, particularly things okay. like, like natural ventilation. Yeah. Good question. So slide 12, um, barriers and opportunities. There was a, we heard a lot that engineering fundamentals, some of the 
basic science and building physics of, of what's going on in these buildings is not very well understood. It would be great to have more research or people are making up their own spreadsheets. Um, there's a desire for better design tools to reduce the amount of effort and the cost to, to actually do the analysis. Um, that's a big barrier. Um, I mentioned controls integration already. Um, frustration with contractors um, implementing innovative design and, and being able to commission it correctly. Um, that actually comes back some to controls. Around integrated design, there was, you know, integrated design is a process, not a solution. It's not the building itself. Um, so everyone was doing it differently and talked about there could be more support or agencies actually had better knowledge about how to go about the integrated design process. Um, knowledge and tools or, or tools for integrated design um, came up a lot, particularly simulation. We have simulation tools, they're very buggy. People spend time trying to debug them, just trying to answer one question, and none of them are really supported supportive for the kind of analysis that the earlier like I want to look at a whole bunch of different measures. Um, could the tools uh, actually support that analysis methodology and, and decrease the amount of time and effort we spend on it? Um, the last line uh, I think really relevant to this group, um, difficult to predict PV size for GME. These were all GME targeted projects and the simulation tools and code compliance uh, is so focused or has it historically been focused just on efficiency and measures and not really actual energy use, but now everyone's trying to use the same simulations to predict actual energy use and size of renewable system. And then if Sean's an expert in that, commercial ZNE and Michael, um, commercial ZNE, uh, it's an even bigger challenge, I think, the residential because there's so much more variation in the end uses. Um, so that, that was a big barrier. So going on to the final slide, um, 13, the recommendations um, that we made coming out of this, there's a lot of candidates for more research uh, to, and for emerging technologies programs. Um, the list on the right came out of this study. These are all fairly obvious things that um, NBI has seen and been talking about forever. Um, but now it's, it's becoming more imperative to get these into the wider market. They're not just innovators. And the big question we're asking is, which things on this, this table to the right here are can scale? Some of these may be more difficult than others. What, what, what's appropriate for the wider market? Um, what should we support in uh, code readiness programs? What should we support that might become something in the code in the future? So one of those uh, recommendations, the next bullet is supporting integrated design process um, and tools. We're talking with pg &E about instead of measure-based code amendments, maybe we're looking at integrated packages where the sum of the parts is, is achieved more than the individual measures themselves. Um, the integrated packages might be requirements in the code, um, or maybe there are things that go into the uh, analysis tools that we know that certain building types, like schools, um, are Cost-effective DNA is achievable, and there's a host of different solutions in different climates for HVAC lighting and so forth. Can we describe those well enough that a simulation tool will do a, a, a bunch of runs across those common solutions and, and show you the least, least life cycle cost for your building, for your climate, and so forth? And that's something that maybe, you know, uh, and from a policy point of view, you can support and get into the market. And lastly, we need better benchmarking and better predictions of actual use so that we can use that information for sizing renewable systems in our GME projects. And that's it. So.